So today, these readings help us to enter into this feast. We celebrate the baptism of the Lord, but also our own baptism. The Responsorial Psalm tells us a little bit about God, His majesty, His glory. Give to the Lord the glory, do His name. The voice of the Lord is mighty, the voice of the Lord majestic. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is enthroned above the flood, enthroned as king forever. And so it reminds us of the majesty, of the glory of God, which is why it's so impressive, this prophecy that we heard in the first reading from the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. So this spirit this majestic glory, the spirit of glory, will descend upon his servant, the Messiah, the Savior. And at the same time, there's a gentleness, a meekness, a humility. Not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break. And then the prophecy continues, and it's, Ambiguous. It's not so clear if he's talking about a person or a people. I formed you and set you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations. And so this prophecy is obviously fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, a man like us. It says when Jesus, after Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water And behold, the heavens were opened for him. And so before, the heavens were closed. There was a chasm between humanity and divinity. A gulf, impossible to bridge. And yet with the baptism, the heavens are opened. And the Spirit of God, descending like a dove, came upon Jesus. And so we have this Spirit of God resting upon Jesus. A voice came from the heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus has the relationship with God the Father as Son of the Father. Which is why St. Paul in the second reading, or why we hear from the Acts of the Apostles, that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, he went about doing good, and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. It was clear that in this man, the Spirit of God was acting. That in this man, the Spirit of God was manifesting. And so, Jesus was doing acts, opening the eyes of the blind, that only God could do. John the Baptist as he was doing his baptism of repentance, it was a preparation because the people had a sense that perhaps the prophecies will be fulfilled in our time. Perhaps we'll be living in the time of the Messiah. And so they were preparing themselves. And the way that they were preparing themselves was exactly by this baptism of John the Baptist, which was a baptism of repentance. The people were coming to John and confessing their sins. It was a way of conversion. It was a way of preparing for the coming of the Savior, for the coming of the Messiah. And John the Baptist was astounded because he recognized Jesus as the chosen one. He recognized that Jesus was the one that the prophets were speaking about. And he's astounded. How is it possible that he's identified with these people that are coming for repentance? How is it possible that he identifies himself with these sinners? But it's exactly what Jesus did. He came and descended. He descended to be among the sinners. He descended to be among the weak ones. Geographically, the Jordan is the lowest place on the earth. It's over 200 yards below sea level. All of this is speaking to us of what God has done. He's descended to the lowest place. 
Above all, in the Passion, he descended to where the sinners are. He descended to the place of receiving the consequences of sin. He descended into death itself. He descended to the lowest place because that's where he encountered us. That's where he found us. He descended to the lowest place and is resurrected. And so he identifies himself with us. He unites himself to us and pulls us to share in his resurrected life. And that's why what we hear in the baptism of Jesus is a foreshadowing of our own baptism. That he went ahead. He went first. He prepared the way. So later this morning, we'll celebrate the baptism of Calvin. And what will happen this morning is exactly what happened on our baptism. And so when each of us were baptized, the heavens also opened for us. The Holy Spirit also descended upon us. And God also saw us as his son or daughter. Because seeing us, he saw Jesus Christ. Seeing us, he sees the beloved son. And so we participate in the divine life. We participate in this relationship between the son and the father. It's all grace. It's nothing we merit. It's nothing we've earned. It's why we can baptize a child. Because we don't do anything to deserve this. It's all God's initiative. It's all God's action. He's the one that's come to us. He's the one that has descended to us. He's the one who's united himself to us. So that we can resurrect with him. So that we can share in his resurrected life. And so this is what we celebrate in our baptism. But this reality is also fulfilled in the Eucharist. And so, once again, in every Eucharist, God descends to where we are. Jesus is made present among us. The Word becomes flesh. And He gives Himself to us. He unites Himself to us so that we can resurrect with Him. So that we can share His divine life. It's a spirit that comes from God. It's a spirit that's divine. And so, we also as Christians are able to do acts that only God can do because we've been united, we've been joined with Jesus Christ in his death and in his resurrection. And so, again, later we'll celebrate this baptism of Calvin where all of this will be made manifest, fulfilled. And as we celebrate the baptism of the Lord, to celebrate the baptism of Calvin, we give thanks out of gratitude for our own baptism in which we've been joined to Jesus Christ so that we can participate in his resurrected life. And this is what we are created for. This is heaven. And it's what we get a foretaste of, we experience already here.